Welcome back, everybody. Uh, during the initial portion of the conference, we mentioned about our guest hosts. Uh, and just to kick it off, I'll introduce uh, our first guest host so I can go eat some lunch. Uh, Graham Lindsay Brown, Longley Brown, I'm sorry, Graham, uh, is one of the four founders of the Connections Conference in the UK. Uh, he's also been absolutely indispensable as far as uh, promoting wargaming within the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense, uh, has worked very closely with their uh, a whole spectrum of different uh, organizations within their government, and is one of the people that has helped create their doctrine, and has come out with a new book that hopefully uh, he will mention briefly. Uh, uh, that is really the first manual on wargaming that that really takes the a very hard-nosed approach to the to the specifics of making things happen. So, uh, and he will take over and introduce our panelists. So, Graham, take it away. Okay, Matt, thank you very much indeed. Don't go to lunch just yet. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is check that you can hear me. I can hear you. Fantastic. All right. In that case, welcome back, everyone, to this panel on Wargaming Lessons Identified and Lessons Learned. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Graham Longley-Brown. Uh, I am one of the Connections UK team. As Matt put up, I'm afraid, wrongly on one of his introductions. Thank you, slides. I'm not a doctor. I'm an infantier, and I think PhD and infantrymen are probably as good an example of an oxymoron than you're going to get anywhere. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just to reciprocate those thanks to Matt, Scott, Tim, everybody at CNA and all those other folks who have, who have brought this amazing conference together. So an absolute heartfelt thank you and well done. It was, it was really good watching that introductory chat scrolling through with people joining from all over the world. Connections has gone global, so very well done. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Jeremy Sapinski momentarily, but just a few words by way of introduction. And in fact, the next thank you is to Jeremy for prompting this conversation, because the conversation these guys are about to have is absolutely critical. So these are not empty introductory words. Uh, and in fact, you'll hear me talk to this same topic if you listen in tomorrow at 12 o'clock, plug over, and I'll talk to this same topic. But why is this topic so important? Well, it strikes me as, as obvious that as wargaming professionals, we must critique our own games and identify the lessons, ident sorry, yeah, identify the lessons that come out of them and then promulgate those within security classification um, parameters, obviously, but we have to let other people know what went well and what went badly and ideally, obviously, do this hon honestly because then those lessons identified can be applied by other people and become lessons learned. Because to be honest, if we don't do this, how on earth do we advance and preserve the art, science and application of wargaming, which is the Connections mission? So this really matters. And it was interesting hearing Matt actually give a talk to the KCR Wargaming Network a few weeks ago. And in fact, he raised a point made by Stephen Downs Martin that, and Stephen was suggesting that, that we have a gray cell to do this lessons identified process. But here's the thing, it strikes me that we should all be doing this as an absolute matter of routine all of the time because we are wargaming professionals. So yes, I agree with Stephen, I agree with everything that Stephen says, but we should not need a gray cell because this is what we should be doing. So that is why this topic is important. And again, thank you, Jeremy. So that's enough from me. I'm now gonna hand over to Dr. Jeremy Sapinski, who is perfectly placed to lead this panel because he is the lead wargame designer at CNA. Uh, and, and also he has a PhD and I don't. So on that, Jeremy, over to you and good luck. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, and a PhD uh, only gets you so far in wargaming where, where experience um, is really the big winner. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen for my presentation in a moment. So hopefully you should all be seeing, um, seeing the front screen. And I want to, uh, again, thank Graham. And I look forward to uh, joining his, uh, his presentation at noon, because as he said, this is really important. Um, and what's really important is, is, is learning and the education that we've got 
as we push through uh, from year to year for Wargaming. So this is uh, what I'm hoping is a start, uh, is, is a panel that we'll be able to repeat year after year from Connections. Um, so that way we can do exactly what Graham is talking about uh, and compile those lessons learned and promulgate them to all of the practitioners that are out there. Uh, the intent in, in choosing the panelists for today has really been to try to get a broad selection, uh, as broad as possible, uh, across industry, academia, and, and defense industries. Uh, and hopefully as we uh, run this panel more often from year to year, uh, we'll be able to include some international participation. Uh, so, so Graham, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be able to pull you in for, for next year as well. So without fur further ado and, and trying to keep on time as best I can, um, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Ellie Bartels is an associate policy researcher and a specialist in national security policy analysis gaming. Her work explores a wide range of strategic and operational concerns with a focus on games on novel topics and those that integrate other analytical techniques. She also advises government centers seeking to improve the quality of their gaming capabilities. Other research includes work on defense planning, force development, measures short of armed conflict, including long-term competition, gray zone, hybrid warfare, and irregular warfare. So Ellie Bartels, um, any, uh, your, less, your um, lessons learned for, for this year in Wargaming. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for putting this group together. Um, I'm going to touch on two points in my opening remarks, one of which I'm sure almost all of us will talk to in some form or another, which is the effects of COVID on gaming um, that I think we've all been trying to manage this year. Um, and a second point I want to bring up is what I'm, I'm starting to see as um, uh, a line that has always been a small part of gaming and seems to be growing a little bit in prominence, which is gaming that's looking at organizational policy within the department. So first, um, you know, the elephant in the room is obviously COVID and the, the way that that's changed how our business practices work. Um, and the first thing I want to say about that, um, you know, I think that in trying to figure out how to game in an era of COVID, the first thing we're, we have to do as responsible gamers is to think about the value of games and when they are absolutely critical and when there's other approaches and methods that start to make more sense. Um, you know, particularly if we're thinking about um, trying to do anything in person right now, I think the bar for um, when we should be willing to accept the risks of gathering people in person should be very, very high. And so I think, you know, a lot of our work going forward for at least, you know, the foreseeable future is either going to have to be digital in nature um, or we may need to think about places where we can substitute other methods rather than gaming and think very carefully about when games really are um, the absolutely essential approach. Thinking about converting games into digital spaces, which is, I think, something that all of us have wrestled with, um, I think my big lesson learned is games are very different from one another different digital platforms are very different from one another. And so when thinking about how to translate any specific game into any specific digital platform, we had to be really careful in thinking about the matches between the design choices we're making and the digital affordances we have available on any specific platform. Um, I think it's really easy to promulgate generalized lessons learned about what works on um, any one platform. And I think it's important to note that those aren't necessarily going to translate to other platforms and results that we have in one type of game going digital may not translate into other spaces. And so I think there's important work for the community to be doing right now and thinking about what are the characteristics of games that allow them to port into different types of digital spaces more or less easily. I think we're all starting to coalesce around some of those lessons learned, but I think there's important work to do in this conference and going forward about trying to, to circulate those, those lessons learned so that we can all be a little bit more tailored in how we approach um, doing digital gaming, because I think it's going to be with us for for the near term at least. Um, you know, I want to leave that there on the digital side, though I'm sure this will come up in the Q&A, and just say a quick word about organizational policy gaming. Um, this is obviously not a new application of games. We've seen games in issues like acquisition, personnel policy, organizational structure um, for a long time, but I think we're starting to see a little bit of um, maybe not a resurgence might be a little strong, but I have noticed there's been a little bit of a trend in doing more of it. I think that's really promising. I think these are, this is an area where games haven't been as applied as frequently as they might um, be beneficial. 
Um, and it's nice to see more work being done publicly. I think this has been an area where there's lots of one-off games that um, you find out, you know, hey, so-and-so did this game 10 years ago only once you're very late in the design process. Um, so, you know, I'm very happy to see, you know, work like CNA's work on organizational design um, being put forward really publicly. Um, Rand's done some work on acquisition gaming that I think fits into kind of a similar mode. Um, and that's a place where I think there's a lot of benefits to exchanging lessons learned beyond some of the traditional force on force areas of gaming that have tended to dominate. Um, and so I'm glad to see that um, maybe coalescing into a little bit more of a practice where we can start um, sort of building a community around that kind of work. In the interest of time, I'll go ahead and stop there um, and hand stuff back to Jeremy. Thanks very much, Ali. That was, that was great. Uh, so next up on our panelists, uh, we have uh, Mr. Scott Chambers. So in addition to the Herculean lift that is uh, making sure Connections keeps going forward, he's agreed to be a member of our panel. Uh, Mr. Scott Chambers is an Assistant Wargaming Specialist with the Center for Applied Strategic Learning's uh, Wargaming Division at the National Defense University. Uh, in his role, he leads the design and development of war games for the National War College and works with other sponsors for war game activities across the National Defense University, Department of Defense Components, and U.S. government agencies. Uh, so, Scott, over to you for lessons learned. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I really appreci appreciate being a part of the panel and I'm glad to be able to speak to everybody here at Connections. Uh, I am going to stop your screen share and just share a couple of slides from me here. Sorry, uh, let me do that. Okay, so I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, wargaming from the educational sphere, uh, specifically uh, a couple of developments that have occurred this year and some of the challenges that we're grappling with. Um, the first is a really important document was published this year, the Joint Chiefs of Staff Vision and Guidance for Professional Military Education, or PME, and Talent Management. This is the shared vision from the uh, all the services for the future of professional military education and talent management. Now, this document's obviously important because right up front uh, in its sort of lines of effort about adapting and innovating professional military education and in developing practical warfighting skills in our education system, there's a very clear role for wargaming. Uh, however, what I think is a little bit more interesting and what I'd like to talk about is the unique opportunities for wargaming and a couple of other uh, elements of this uh, vision and guidance, which is one, identifying future leaders. Um, and I'm kind of putting these out as challenges to the wargaming community to figure out how we can support uh, these pillars of the vision and guidance. So identifying future leaders. One of the things that uh, all games I think can work to do is to better capture the uh, try to improve our fidelity of capturing the player experience and more importantly how well players uh, make decisions, how well they uh, use some of the techniques and some of the um, skills that we hope we impart on them in education. Um, and what can we do to pull data from those games to help us identify successful future leaders who are exhibiting the sort of skills and attitudes we hope. Uh, the second is to connect joint force design and development to professional military education. Historically, wargaming has always been a rich source for force design and development, uh, particularly back in the 1920s at the uh, Naval War College, but across the history of wargaming, that's been true. Uh, however, that sort of con the connective tissue between the uh, doctrine development, the force design elements um, of the Department of Defense and our educational institutions have actually feed. And I think uh, one of our challenges is to figure out how to rebuild that connective tissue. And lastly, PME as a strategic asset. This is a space where uh, we can really, there's a lot of work to be done in how can we use uh, war games, experiential education uh, to help build the sort of uh, trust and rapport between ourselves and our allies and partners around the world. Uh, 
couple of challenges I just want to briefly highlight uh, that we've seen this year. A couple of them are COVID related. Um, one is just the challenge of immersion for participants. Uh, a lot of, uh, as we move our games into the digital environment, one of the things that we have noticed in particular for our participants is trying to make sure that we're still able to convey a sense of immersion in the game and uh, ability to really connect with what we're having uh, the roles and the scenarios that we're putting our participants in. Second issue has been digital gaming platforms, licenses, and trying to net that up with uh, many, almost all students using their personal devices. Um, this is a challenge and something that I put out to the commercial industry to help us overcome uh, in how can we have tools that we can deploy at the enterprise level um, across a wide variety of pla uh, platforms, personal devices, and trying to overcome the licensing challenges that are always inherent in working with the government. A couple of non-COVID related challenges. Um, as we look at space as a warfighting domain, I think we have a lot of work we still need to do in terms of building our vocabulary and kind of shared conceptualization of how wargaming plays in um, uh, space. Um, Second issue, I know I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to go quick. Uh, identifying even more diverse black swans to incorporate into wargaming, trying to balance a desire of many of our sponsors to include even more dramatic black swans, like we've seen how much COVID has upset the current situation, to incorporate those into wargaming without letting our wargaming be dominated purely by those black swans. And lastly, as always, adjudication is a thorny issue, and I'm happy to talk about that much more. You'll see this slide a couple more times uh, throughout the conference, but if you're interested in helping me overcome these challenges in PME, uh, we'd be delighted to have you uh, join the Collaboration for Wargaming and Academics and Research Group if you're part of the DOD Professional Military Education Enterprise. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. I appreciate those comments. And I'm going to get, uh, I, at this point, I will pass it over uh, to Dr. Jacqueline Schneider. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Schneider is a Hoover Fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, a non-resident fellow at the Naval War College's Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute, and a senior policy advisor to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Her research focuses on the intersection of technology, national security, and uh, political psychology with a special interest in cybersecurity, unmanned technologies, and Northeast Asia. Her work has appeared in Security Studies, Journal of Conflict Resolution, Strategic Studies Quarterly, uh, and numerous other journals. And with that, I will pass it over to Jacqueline. Thank you so much. And it's exciting to be um, sitting on a, a Morris panel, especially um, in my current um, position at Stanford. I feel a bit like a, the, the black swan being the academic representative um, within this wargaming community. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about kind of the, the opportunities that, that there are for wargaming in academia, talk a little bit about why and how it's different than some of the more kind of DOD or practitioner-based communities. And then I want to highlight a lot of the emerging work and a lot of the opportunities that are happening right now. So, you know, kind of, I think the first question really is like, why are we even including academics in this discussion, you know, inside war, inside wars? And, you know, the reality is, is that while academia has fallen kind of in and out of and back in love with wargaming over the last, you know, multiple decades, a lot of the kind of initial research into wargaming and especially kind of the role of wargaming in nuclear policy and practice actually started in academia. So, you know, the, the shellings of the world, the, the Bloomfields, a lot of their insights about how nuclear politics worked came from a series of war games that they ran um, at MIT. So, you know, those have, have waned, um, you know, in like the 80s and 90s, but I think we're seeing an emergence of war gaming within academia. And that's for a few reasons. One is that um, I think there was a bit of a, a desire not to get involved with war games because there was a perception that it had to do with kind of Vietnam and being pro-war. I don't think that really exists in, in today's generation of scholars. The second is that we've kind of gone through an experimental revolution in social sciences. And so social scientists have been moving more and more to these kind of immersive um, 
human behavior kind of scenarios in order to understand big questions. And so wargaming is a logical extension of the, um, of the work that, that was coming out of survey experiments, for example, in the past. So how is wargaming different in academia? Okay, well, the first thing is there's no sponsor. Um, and that's fantastic when you're building games because you don't have to worry about kind of making sure that you're balancing the sponsor's kind of operational needs with war game design. Uh, the con there is that usually as an academic, you're generating your own money. So the great thing is you have freedom. The bad thing is you're going to have to generate money to run these things. And uh, related, um, in terms of logistics, I think one of the pros of working on war games in academia is it is a little bit less onerous because you don't have these high logistical back chains. I used to work at the Naval War College, so I understand like how a war gaming department, like a real machine, can move. And that can be very onerous. Um, but the con for academia is that usually means that um, it's very hard to run games at scale. And I've been running a series of games with colleagues at the Naval War College that we've run for over two years. And it's very difficult to run these games at scale without the logistical back end of having an entire war gaming department behind you. Um, and then I think one of the other big differences between academia um, and other war gaming within the more practitioner community is just the different communities that we're speaking to. I think, and this is coming from somebody who's lived in both those worlds, I think that within the kind of more wargaming DOD community, it is, as I think Ellie Bartels had a great War on the Rocks piece talking about guild. Um, and I think that you're, you're speaking to each other um, and you're speaking to the defense consumer. Um, and that leads to a different type of war game, right? Whereas in academia, I think maybe the con is that while we don't have to kind of have this guild-like community, we, we do have our own communities that are maybe um, lean towards the positivists. So, you know, maybe there's almost too much science on the academic side in order to get these uh, war games really get a lot of support and they get published. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the kind of the emerging work that's happening within academia and highlight kind of the, the role that they've had in both increasing substantive knowledge and then also in increasing our understanding of wargaming as a methodology. So first, I'm going to just highlight some people. I hope you guys can find them online. Um, on drones and crisis escalation, Eric Lynn Greenberg, uh, now at MIT, um, did a series of small-scale war games that looked at the effect that inclusion of drones had in whether crises escalated or not. Um, he found that they did not increase crisis escalation, uh, crisis instability. Um, there's also a lot of really good work that's actually being highlighted in this, pan in this uh, conference by Andrew Reddy, Bethany Goldblum, and the folks in the project on nuclear gaming, as well as Sandia, looking at the role of tactical nuclear weapons in crisis escalation. Um, and then on cyber and crisis stability, I want to highlight the work of Dr. Brandon Valeriano and Ben Jensen at Marine Corps University. Um, and then I have a work with, Be with Ben Schechter and Rachel Schaefer on cyber and nuclear stability. Um, and what's interesting about these cyber uh, war games is that the cyber war games um, seem to find very little evidence of escalation, even, even as we dial up the, the violence or dial up the amount of effect that the cyber operations create. Um, and I I think that's a really interesting kind of phenomenon to see in gaming. In terms of innovations that academia can bring or has brought to wargaming, um, both Andrew Reddy's project and my project with Ben Schechter and Rachel Schaefer all focused on iterations and generalizability. So our game that we're finishing up now, we had um, over 500 players over two years. Um, each, I think that means that we're at about um, 100 games iterated at like 12 different locations. And we were able to do this kind of iteration and generalizability and holding things constant. Um, Mostly because we didn't have a sponsor, right? I mean, what sponsor is going to be okay with two years of war games that you've run all over the world? And so that's something that we've worked on. That's something that Andrew Reddy's team and the Project in Nuclear Gaming have worked on. Also, I've made the transition to virtual interfaces and Zoom. I know the Project on Nuclear Gaming was also working on virtual interfaces. Um, I think in the war gaming practitioner community, you guys call that um, distributed gaming. Um, so I think there's innovations that we've already been experimenting with on the academic side, especially since we were always unclassified, and that, that actually can actually lean towards helping the more classified side of the community. 
The other thing that um, academia is introducing is the inclusion of more overtly experimental design within games. So thinking about treatments within games, thinking about controlling for different variables, thinking about holding things constant. And then that allows for a much kind of nicer ability to look at causal effects within games. Once again, this is a luxury that you can do when you don't have a sponsor who wants to answer 50 questions in one game. Um, and then I think something that an innovation that academia brings to wargaming is just the ability to ask difficult questions, including politically fraught questions. So these are all things that we're going to be um, working on in academia. We have a community that we're building within academia that's going to look at, you know, testing the importance of expertise and the importance of the sample and the importance of the medium, whether it's virtual, in-person or surveys, and thinking about how to measure player buy-in and external validity, and then just adding to new substantial no substantive knowledge on AI and bio threats. So um, I'm excited to hear the other panelists. Sorry for talking so much. Um, look forward to discussing more. Thanks very much. Um, and next up is uh, myself. Uh, so I'll go really quickly, hopefully. Um, I'm the lead wargaming designer at, at CNA Center for Naval Analysis. Uh, I'll normally, in a non-COVID year, run about uh, a dozen uh, war games a year. I'm mostly focused on national defense, um, but also uh, looking at some of the public health and security sectors as well. Uh, so my, I, I really appreciate those comments about the difference between having a sponsor and not having a sponsor. Um, and, and I'm gonna focus on the sponsor aspects of it uh, for, for my lesson learned. Uh, and it's also COVID related, um, but specifically, I'd like to talk about how you deal with an emergent COVID issue when you have a plan to run an in-person war game and suddenly now you have, you're faced with this dilemma, right? Uh, when COVID came up, we had a number of war games that we were expecting to run in person. Uh, and we were forced with the decision to either immediately adapt to something new or, or to try to delay and run the war game later. Uh, and I think there are some pros and cons to both of, both of the solutions. Uh, and if you immediately adapt, right, you can produce something and you're gonna produce it on schedule but it tends to be costly, both in terms of time uh, that the people need to put into it, as well as money in, in the, the materials and the time and, and shifting the entire effort. But it also requires a flexible workforce. You need people that can suddenly adapt to doing something new and pr probably pull in expertise that you weren't expecting to pull in. Um, and you're unable to, you're unlikely to hit your, your original goal for what you're trying to do because virtual wargaming and, and in-person wargaming are very different but it also requires sponsor flexibility. So, so to hit those, like in, in the defense sector, we're working for someone. Uh, and if they're not gonna get their goal, are they gonna be happy with the end result? And the other option, which is what we saw a lot of our sponsors choose to do, was to delay and try to run the original game later. Uh, on a pro side of that, we, we get results that are closer to our original goal, but on the con, we might get those results very, very late. Um, cost is going to go up even if you're not running the game because as, as you're planning to redo some things. Um, you might still have to redesign it later, which is one of the problems that we ran into here at CNA. Um, we, we kept delaying the game and delaying the game. Uh, and then all of our games got delayed till right about the same time when all of the sponsors have had enough of delays and said we actually need to get some results So how can we move things over to work over to a virtual environment. So, so I would throw out the lessons learned for us in that regard is to look carefully at the situation, at your capacity, and at your sponsor's flexibility to really try to, to grapple from an individual perspective, from game to game, from sponsor to sponsor, whether that's the right choice. Uh, and, and looking back on it, I know that at CNA, we would make some different decisions as to what we would push to move virtual and what we would try to, to delay to do later. And I'm going to leave my comments there for now and uh, move over to Mr. Ken Shogren from uh, General Motors. So uh, Ken Shogren is a manager on General Motors strategic risk management team. In his role, Ken is responsible for supporting C-suite and senior level, I'm sorry, C-suite and senior leaders with strategic decisions and enterprise risk management. Ken's focus is to improve decision making through the use of decision techniques, including game theory and business wargaming. Ken? Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, just wanted to start out with a couple of points on um, 
business working and um, like Dr. Schneider's comments being coming at this uh, convention uh, from kind of the outsider the the space of the business world uh, and wargaming is not something that normally lines up uh, and people think is uh, a natural match. But it turns out it actually is useful and has proven itself to be very effective for us. Um, we've been doing it for a number of years actually uh, and apply it to a number of different uh, parts of our organization. And from those activities, we've actually come up with a number of uh, what I'll call key lessons learned that we try to incorporate in our games that we develop. So the first one is that we try to create discomfort, especially in the leadership. Now, normally you'd think that if you're bringing people together to explore a difficult topic or a situation, that you'd want them to be calm and relaxed. Um, but we've done some internal research that has actually revealed that decision quality actually improves a little bit as the discomfort of the decision makers go. And it's really tied to kind of breaking up their assumptions and biases that may be in place. And we can create this discomfort in a variety of ways. One of the more effective ones is to disrupt but still honor the chain of command. Um, we frequently are bringing people together from across the enterprise, uh, from many different departments, many different functions. And when we bring them together, we oftentimes ask them to take on roles that are outside of their normal job function. Uh, we often change who might be reporting to who from a structure perspective. We say, we want you to take on this, this team, this role, and lead this where normally they might be in a more analyst or a follower role. Uh, and when we do this, it, it tends to increase the uh, number of alternative views and helps avoid some of the follow the leader type thinking. Well, the boss said this, so we probably ought to think the same thing. It tends to break that up. Another technique that we've used um, is called deny the obvious. That's what we nicknamed it. And really it's the idea that assumptions and biases and familiarity with a subject are kind of the bane of decision makers. Um, when they're facing a challenge, especially if it's a new one, our leaders typically will draw on experiences and heavily leverage those things to find a new solution. Um, and it's not uncommon for those solutions to end up looking remarkably similar to past approaches uh, that may have seen partial success or no success, but they still think it's the right idea. And in order to disrupt that and encourage innovation, we tell them that the most obvious answer that they want to bring forward uh, is simply not allowed. Um, we deny them the ability to impose it and use it. Uh, and we do that through a couple of ways of trying to be creative about, well, you know, the competitor has already done that, um, or um, you can't do that from a financial reason, it's been turned down, uh, you don't have the funding for that activity. And we make them look for another idea, and that helps. But one of our other challenges that we face consistently is that amongst our leadership, we're bringing them from many different parts of the organization, we don't always have time, calendars. Uh, and so when we bring them together, we don't let them necessarily play the game. We, instead, we ask them to kind of set out the marching orders, set the plans, design, uh, define the strategies, and we try to extract from our games as much information as possible, and we let the analysts play it. And they'll play through the repetitions, they'll get the replays, and they'll come back and report to the senior leaders how the game played out, uh, a little bit like the military approach for an after-action review. And when they come back, we tend to highlight some key information around where did we see things um, become apparent? When were the clues? What were the signals that indicated that one particular approach was leading towards success or leading towards failure? And we emphasize that so that when the leaders get into the real decisions and start to apply them and time starts to pass and they start to be realized, then they start to recognize those signals and our organization will then get called and say, I'm seeing this, is this in line with what we were expecting? I didn't think that this was gonna be happening. And that gives us two things. The reports that we've generated, the games that we've played become a common communication tool for us to use and leverage uh, to help explain where we see things happening. Um, and it also lets us identify if something is different. Um, we may have played it out and seen that a particular course of action by a player would lead to a, a positive result, um, but they've taken a different turn in reality. And they'll say, is this a new change? And it's like, it's not a new change. They're going to discover very shortly that that plan uh, will have a disruption and they're gonna swing it back the other direction. And we'll say, just wait a little bit and about a month later or maybe a week later, depending on the nature of the decision, sure enough, the players will switch and swing back. So 
you know, out of these, some of the key things just to kind of recap it, you know, create discomfort and leadership, um, disrupt but honor the chain of command, uh, mix up the players and the participants, deny the obvious, let the analysts play the game, and then set the stage for some real-time advising so that you can be consulted back. This has all worked well for us in live situations. Uh, looking at 2020, we've had to make a few adjustments that some of the other panelists have already mentioned. Uh, getting engagement, especially in a virtual world, can be difficult. Uh, so we have worked on ways to try to get that to happen. A number of collaborative tools help in that direction. Um, we normally try to book fairly lengthy afternoons or an entire day to do our uh, game sessions. Uh, that can be very difficult in the virtual world and very demanding uh, from a person's energies. So we have actually designed their games and adjusted them to split them up. So we run them in much shorter components and, and then string them together over a course of days. And then lastly, um, there's a sense of higher uncertainty that's in motion right now with COVID and, and the world in general, and the pace of change is fast. Um, and so we try to leverage some of that to help create that discomfort, but at the same time, we try to mitigate it a little bit because too much discomfort makes the decisions uh, also difficult. So that's kind of the business approach on how we're looking at some of the wargaming techniques. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Jeremy and uh, questions. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, and then we've got one more panelist, uh, Becca Wasser. Uh, Ms. Becca Wasser is a fellow at the Defense Program at the Center for New American Security. Her research areas include wargaming, U.S. defense strategy, force posture, and Middle East security. She is also an adjunct instructor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, where she teaches an undergraduate course on wargaming. Over to you, Becca. Great. So I'm going to be as brief as I possibly can, which means I'm going to talk really fast uh, because we are running short on time. Um, so for, I'm going to focus on some of my lessons learned in light of the COVID-19 crisis. And so um, I can think of these in sort of three buckets and three lessons learned. The first is, um, and it's somewhat sacrilegious for me to say this, but just because it could be a game doesn't mean it should be a game. And this is similar to a point that Ellie made. But, you know, given everything that's going on, the shift to virtual games, you know, we need to think long and hard about whether there are other applicable methods to answer the question. And would that be better with some of the current constraints that we are facing? Uh, as part of that, we also need to think about what is it that we lose when we shift to a virtual game? You know, we do lose elements of, you know, the human interactions that make games really powerful tools. You know, if it's a game that's entirely focused on how uh, individuals interact, whether it's a role-playing game or a game that's looking at different perceptions, you know, is that something that we want to move to a virtual space or is that something that perhaps we want to think about another method to explore that? And along those lines, we also shouldn't be shy about pushing back on sponsors. We in the gaming community have a duty of care to ourselves, to our participants, as well as to others. And um, a lot of times when I've heard people talking about, oh, okay, can we do this for a sponsor or not? Should we hold this game in person? It's very much focused around, you know, who we think of, the war gamers and the participants. We oftentimes forget about the individual labor, that logistics tale that Jackie was mentioning, that go into wargaming, you know, and in some ways the invisible laborers that are part of this. So this is the note takers, these are the caterers, this is the security guards, the person who comes and has to sit at the front desk who otherwise wouldn't be coming into the office. We have a duty of care to them, so we need to think really long and hard before having any in-person games for, frankly, some time. The second, lessons learned, second lesson learned is that we should think about how it is that we can best reframe games to maximize the virtual environment. So, you know, I think we've seen for those of us who've been running virtual games, you know, there are some that work better than others. For the most part, I found that um, operational games work better in a virtual setting than some of the strategic games. Um, and so, you know, at CNAS, one of the things that we've been able to do is shift our operational gaming platforms to Zoom. Um, you know, but we've also reframed some of the questions that we were initially gaming to think about how it is that we could better use these virtual environments. So, you know, there are ways in which you can better represent covert action and secrecy 
difference in communication methods, whether that's communications degradation or disruption, those are things that you can actually do better in a virtual environment than you can in an in-person game. So thinking about ways in which we can actually use this to our advantage and use, and use it to represent different phenomena in a way that is a bit more useful to some of our questions. We should also think about ways in which we can leverage being virtual to add in new and diverse voices into wargaming, whether that's because people couldn't participate because of geography or perhaps classification. Um, and lastly, you know, thinking about how virtual games, by the virtue of being lower cost, uh, that allows us to definitely run game series, um, which is something that I've advocated for, I know Ellie has, and a number of others who are participating today. So thinking about ways in which we can just build better games using these virtual environments. And then my last lesson learned is to sort of find ways to make up what it is that you lose. If you are losing the human element in a game, think about ways in which you can pair a virtual game with another research method in order to better capture it. Um, the one thing for me that I think we lose the most in virtual games is transparency. To me, a good game is transparent about its development and the biases that are uh, written into the game. Um, a good game has no kidding rules that govern adjudication and the outcomes. And you just aren't going to see that transparency as much with virtual games uh, because adjudication is happening behind the camera, because people have Zoom fatigue and they're signing off. All of these are real reasons why not to do it. But we need to also recognize what it is that we're losing and make up for that. So because we are not being as transparent about games, it's reinforcing negative lessons. People are thinking that war game's easy, that it's made up of fiction, or perhaps maybe it's just a software that you input something into. I actually had to explain to someone the other day that no, Ed McGrady is not a piece of software in terms of adjudicating an operational game. Um, you know, so we need to think about ways in which we can build back that transparency in a virtual environment. And perhaps maybe this is we need to, as a community, be a little bit better about writing up some of our um, some of our writing game reports, uh, not just focused on outcomes, but also properly documenting our process and identifying, uh, you know, some of our biases and appropriately caveating what we did. Another area is that we can perhaps add a little bit more structure to games, to virtual games, even though that's relatively difficult because there is some cost involved in that. And I'll just uh, end really briefly with a warning about, you know, what it is that we're losing. We're not going to lose the most in virtual games uh, in terms of operational gaming. I think we're actually going to lose the most progress that's been made in strategy games. Um, these are going to languish again and it's going to become, you know, the land of the bog sat and it's going to allow people to essentially fraud and cheat their way through this community instead of doing it the right way. So I think, you know, as a, as a community, as war gamers and war game designers, we need to think about ways in which we can build better strategy games that uh, are amenable to virtual platforms. Thanks. Thanks very much, Becca. Uh, and I will add one final lessons learned that when you're organizing a panel on a strict time limit, uh, remember to account for the introduction time and the time it takes to switch between panelists. Uh, so with that, I will throw it over to the moderator uh, and uh, see if there are any questions that we could fit in into our remaining time. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, just a quick question that I think everyone can take a chance to throw an answer at is, do you have any advice on how to improve supporting people to be more human while we're zooming through war games? Uh, so just best practices from the digital environment we currently find ourselves in and likely maintain for a while. Uh, can we go in reverse alphabetical order on that one? Yep. Um, I'll, I'll let someone else answer just in terms of time. The, the only thing we've seen um, is just giving people more time, so, which is a horrible because you have the Zoom um, fatigue, but you, we need more time for deliberation in virtual games than you do in the real games. And then I would say if it's at all possible to um, use the virtual interface to, um, 
to ask questions where people would be entering the virtual interface anyway. So like we're doing an analysis of our virtual versus our um, in person to see like, okay, if we have decision makers who, you know, are on the NSC and they're making decisions via Zoom, probably not Zoom, but something awful like WebEx. Um, how are they, you know, how is that virtual interface actually changing their decision making in crises? So you can take the virtual and instead of trying to recreate the reality, use that kind of insertion as the intervening variable of interest to understand the question. Also difficult though with sponsors, but Yeah, we've been seeing that problem as well a lot. Uh, and some of our online games are turning into spreadsheet games that have a question and answer component. And I don't think that's particularly meaty either. So so it's a it's a tough one to grapple with. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think that the converse example would be building games that allow people to use asynchronous ways of communicating um, to be able to think more deeply, think at a time and space that worked better for them. Um, you know, one thing that I've always gotten as feedback is games are great for the extroverted players. Introverted players often feel like they've been hit by a bus. And so, you know, I think if there are ways to make it easier for um, players who might want a little bit more time, be more comfortable in written medium, um, those could be opportunities where we might be able to bring those folks into the discussion in a way that's actually um, a more natural communication mechanism for them. I think as in general, gamers tend to be on the extroverted side of the spectrum. We tend to like that type of like intense in-person engagement. Um, and so I think that's actually a hard job for us to like empathize with folks fully and like put ourselves in their shoes. But I do think there are some opportunities there um, if we can think carefully about it. All right, on that note, um... We're going to call this panel a wrap. Thank you everyone so much for your comments and questions. I know a few of them got answered in text. So if you had a question you're looking for follow up, check the answered section. Um, and then we'll be saving the questions and inputs as well uh, that didn't get answered so that there can be some email follow up at the end.